I'm starting residency tomorrow, and I don't know how I feel about it. I've pictured this day for so many years. Like, I was 14 on the couch watching Scrubs, and I was like, I wonder what my first day as a doctor would be like. When, when I'm JD, and I get to go to the hospital and do that. And here I am living, living that 14-year-old's dream. <sighs> and all I have is a pit in my stomach. I have like the worst case of the Sunday scaries and I'm just, I'm just sitting here with this weight. I don't know. Hoping I picked right. It's like the first day of the rest of my life. I, I hope it's good. I honestly really do. And I hope I can like look back on this in six months and say, yeah, it is, it is good press and you picked right because I've seen a lot of people regret being in medicine and a lot of people feel like they didn't pick right. And I'm about to find out. First days down and I gotta say, everyone was really impressed with me. They were like, Preston, how are you the best intern we've ever had? This guy's just on fire, he's so good. I'm just kidding, I didn't even know how to operate the EMR. I had to ask for help for literally everything and I like couldn't click one of the boxes, so I like ran back to the patient's room trying to get more information from them, and then they had already discharged, so I freaked out about that for 20 minutes. But then some of my skills came back, like I deferred to primary team, continued home meds. It only took me like 15 minutes to remember the word euthymic, so <laughs> watch out world. Resident psychiatrist coming through. How was your first day of residency, Maggie? Were the wards busy? Replete Meow Mix stat. All right, two days into residency and I held the pager for 20 minutes. I put in admission orders and somebody called me. I was like, hello, this is Preston with Psychiatry. And it was the wrong number. They, they called the wrong service. And so I did what I've always dreamed of doing, not be a dick about it. I, hey man, I think you meant to call the inpatient team. This is the triage team. And like, I can get you their number. He was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Yeah, yeah, I, I think I can get it for my senior. So basically all of my trauma as a med student from getting yelled out on the phone is now healed. And Maggie waited patiently for my return. Also, I have the interviewing skills of a lobotomized rat. So the social worker totally scooped me up and covered everything I forgot to ask. So thanks social worker. What going on out there? Still on the to-do list is correct a med student's notes with a couple stylistic changes and then delete the whole thing. And also I need to tell a med student you can go home if you want, but like no pressure though. And then watch them, no, I'm just playing. <laughs> Day three was not a W. Come here. And the only way I can describe today, I'm gonna be with a skit later, but here's a teaser. Hold on to your hats! You're about to get pounded! Oh, hello. Just like page after page after page and I was definitely let out to swim for the first time. I felt like I was in deep water. Yesterday was ceremoniously signing my first order, like, oh, look at me, I signed a medication. What a psychiatrist, and today was just like, do it, do it, do it. It felt like being trapped in ice and having a drill sergeant come yell at you to tell you, like, why aren't you moving? Because I had all these tasks to do, but I was so incompetent that I felt frozen. I need to put in this special chart order, but I don't know how to navigate this part of the EMR because I haven't done this ritual yet, so I'm just stuck here. And, oh, uh, actually, I take that back. The biggest W was I reminded my senior to send my med students home, and I felt bad because I, for the first time, became that resident. I was, I was like, seeing the patient with them, I'm, I'm, okay, you write the mental status exam, I can go over it with you, and then I'll, you, you get out of here, you get home, it's like four, you know? And then here I am just like worried about all the million things going around, I'm just trying to finish this note. And I look over and the med student's sitting there and I was like, I've become the thing I swore to destroy. I finally get it, you know? All those times that I sat there quietly twiddling my thumbs as a med student and be like, how do they not notice me? Why don't they pay attention? Like, I, I get it. I, I, as much as I tried to empathize, like, yeah, my resident's busy. Yeah, but stuff is going on. But until you feel like you're in open water trying to, trying to get your nose above the grate as the tide comes in to breathe, you just don't get it. And I feel like I, I finally understand now. So 
I'm sorry. I, I need to... We got this. I did not realize how protected I was as a med student from all this menial labor. Because let me tell you, there is a lot of menial, just all the stuff in the chart, these superfluous e-tabs and things you have to click and go through that I was never exposed to. Every time a resident was like, don't come with me, this won't be for learning. They were totally right, because now I am them. And it's not for learning at all. The first time in my medical career where I've acknowledged that I am not just a learner, I am an employee. I am labor. On one hand, it sucks because it means you have to do work. But on the other hand, it's kind of cool. It also means you're needed, like I'm needed. I, I provide value, which is a good feeling. As a med student, I, it was always just out learning. I, all I do is learn, I'm just a sponge, I'm gonna absorb knowledge, but then nobody needed me at the end of the day. And that kind of usefulness, I think is, it's cool to have. Like I, even if I'm just performing menial tasks, I can do something that changes the workflow for somebody else and it helps them. They need me to get stuff done. I was not expecting excitement of being a doctor to wear off so quickly. Like, I knew it was gonna become routine eventually, but two weeks? Two weeks? Damn. When I first showed up to the hospital, I was ambivalent and I was questioning if it was the right choice and acknowledging this is really the rest of my life, but I still had that feeling, that, that excitement, you know, I'm a doctor and, and I've worked my whole life up to this point. But those magical two letters after my name have now been used to rubber stamp an infinite amount of orders and check off boxes and click tabs and do everything that I'm destined to do. And don't get me wrong, I still like psychiatry and I find value in what I do. I just didn't think the butterflies were gonna die so fast. I'm gonna go outside, sit on the porch. Reminds me of this speech I was given by this high school valedictorian. He said, I worked my whole life for this point and it felt really, really good for about 15 seconds. Now, I always think about that whenever I have this big accomplishment I work towards. I'm like, what's gonna happen on second number 16? I don't know. What's that? And maybe I already hit second 16. I don't know. I don't have any grand wisdom on this. I'm, I just have this loss of a feeling and I'm trying to examine it. So figure it out. And, and maybe it's just that this is gonna become a part of my life and that's okay. Every day is not gonna be exciting. Clinic is lonely. This never occurred to me as a med student, but when you're in clinic, even as a resident, you spend so much time alone. When, whenever I was a student, I was shadowing in clinic. I remember my preceptors would make comments like, it's, it's nice to have someone around today. And I'm like, you sure? I'm just staring at the back of your head. I'm like, is this really that fun? For but I understand it now. They spend a ton of time alone. You're literally an island. Just whoosh, waiting for ships to come in and interact with you. Ooh, building. Uh, prior authorization. It, it doesn't sit in when you're talking to patients or even staffing with your preceptors. It's when you're sitting alone at your desk, typing notes. Maybe eating alone just hits different. I, I think it's just meant to be a social activity. So when you're eating alone at your desk while you type notes, it just feels like the ultimate picture of isolation. Just, wow, look at me. Me and solitude, baby. We go way back. I love the harmony of my clinic. I like that there's structure to it and I appreciate the pacing. It's nice for me. But with structure comes monotony. And I don't know how that contrasts to the chaos of inpatient, how unpredictable it is, but with that stuff came camaraderie. And it, I felt like I was on a team and I enjoyed that aspect of it. But I did enjoy the hours. And it's tough. My, my, I think my philosophy of patient care lines up with outpatient stuff. Why do I feel like this during the day? So we'll see. We'll see how it evolves. And maybe, you know, maybe it's different when I'm the person in charge of the clinic and calling the shots and everything. Or maybe it's not. Who knows? That's how these things go. I've decided that there are three stages to the first two months of residency. Stage one, I've so named it high viz, high riz. High riz because you are excited to be in the hospital. You've matched and you've done the thing. And I'm like, oh yeah, I came to play, baby. Let's do 
high vis because someone is watching every single movement you're making and you're also still messing up. Like they are literally dragging you through the EMR and you're clicking boxes wrong and putting in orders incorrectly and like every freaking thing. Ugh. This was the worst stage, honestly, but I was carried through by my enthusiasm. And just after about three days under this scenario, you stop messing up with that high visibility. You live in this little box, you're like, okay, I was told to do this formula. I can follow this algorithm, this little box. I have ordered Miralax before and I will do it again. People start trusting you to make minor decisions on your own, like talking to the nurses and putting in orders. And now you actually have more liability mess. I honestly felt like I was messing up more in this second stage, which I've so named the Valley of Suck. The Valley of Suck is the absolute worst because now the excitement of being a doctor has worn off, but all the stress from that first high vis high risk section is still lingering. You're still questioning yourself over every single decision and you still feel paralyzed, but you don't have that immediate support person. So this looks like me sitting in the workroom at 10 p.m. not sure if I should order the morphine or if I should consult medicine or call my attending or do something. The storm is still heavy, but I felt like that thing that was supporting me, that enthusiasm was starting to wane. So every day I went to work, I was like, this sucks. Like this honestly sucks. I just, all I feel is stressed all the time. That's actually why I stopped posting these diaries as often because I had nothing positive to say. I went to work every day just thinking, I I'm pretty sure I chose the wrong career field and this is awful. Like I actively hate this and I was embarrassed to share that with you guys. And I also just didn't want, I don't know, I don't like just talking about things that are negative all the time. But then you slowly climb out of the valley of suck and get into the third phase, which I don't have a name for you because I'm just entering phase three. But that's when the stress that was hitting you every day also starts to fade. You've done things 10, 15, 20 times now. You can order to the pharmacy, you know, to switch what pharmacies you're doing. You have become conversational with the song and dance of the system a little bit. So when you make mistakes, they're few and far between, and there's the first time some aspect of a routine starts to reveal itself. The excitement's still gone, but now I'm not stressed every second every day, and it just starts to feel like the regularness of life. It, so in conclusion, it's going to suck. It's going to get a little bit better, promptly get much worse, and slowly, surely, dependably, it will get better as you climb out of the valley of suck. You, you test the depth of the water with both feet, and then you have to walk out soaking wet. And like Dr. Glockenflocken said, the way you climb out of this is by sucking a little bit less every day. There's no big victories. And now I'm feeling okay. I, I, there's times where I actually felt like I helped someone. I got a window seat for Maggie. I anticipated a problem the other day. It's gonna be all right. I think it's gonna be all right. To be honest, I don't know if I'm getting better or if people just trust me more. As a med student, I remember getting grilled on my presentations constantly. I, I couldn't get a word out without somebody cutting me off. His idols were within normal limits and his CMP was unremarkable. Un unremarkable, what? I wanna hear them. Do you even know what unremarkable means? I now I don't. I had to list off every lab value to prove that, that I knew what I was doing and then I was scrutinized over all of it. But now it goes something like this. Preston, what's, what's the status on your patient five? Oh, uh, we got the MRI back. It was totally normal, no restricted diffusion. So I think we're good to sign off. And they're like, great, good job, intern. The second I got two letters after my name, everyone in the hospital treated me different. And right now I feel dumber than I did a year ago. I still have this brain rot from five, six months of basically not really doing anything, which is, which is nice, I wouldn't trade it. But damn. When I go to a room and say I'm pressed with neurology, if anything, I have to temper expectations about everything because I'm the psych intern on neurology. People ask me questions and look to me for answers and I have to spend the whole time saying, I'm gonna go ask my upper level, my attending, my dad. I don't know, I'm gonna ask my dad. That's, that's basically all of medicine. Uh, my dad said we need to get the CT. Well, my dad said we don't need the CT. Okay, well, I'm gonna go talk to my daddy and maybe my dad should talk to your dad. Oh God, Maggie got in a bush. Magnolia, you're doing outside time. She's ran back into here. Ma'am, hello. She's a tortie and look at, look at this. This is prime tortie camouflage in here. I just saw her tail move earlier though. So I found her, she's right here. <laughs> Maggie, please, ma'am, come out. I have tweets. I have treats, ma'am. Come here. No, Maggie. Ugh. She jetted behind me and my head was in the butt. You wanna go back inside? Okay, we can go back inside. There we go.
I did a medicine sub eye and I felt like I was on top of my stuff. And it's just so different when you're the intern. When I was a med student, all I had to do was know the plan. <laughs> yeah, I know that plan. And I can write it in a little note for you guys. Nice. Or maybe call collateral, do some other stuff, update the family. But now I have to make sure all the orders are in properly. I'm getting paged every 10 minutes about something that needs to be updated or something that needs to be changed. All I want in life, one train of thought. Just let me finish one train of thought. That would be vacation. I'd probably have to take leave for that. Internal medicine just feels like the executive function Olympics. It's like I'm carrying around an entire ball of laundry, but they're all socks. And every time I move, I drop another sock. And so I bend down to pick up the sock and then I just drop more socks. Being on medicine just makes me feel like I'm on week one. Ugh. And on top of it now, I have to watch the med students. Literally like me six months ago. Dude, it's hard. It's really hard. It is so much easier to write something yourself than it is to go through someone else's entire workflow and know 95% of the details are probably right, but your eyes are glazing over as you're trying to find the one detail that you need to switch because you need to know everything like the back of your hand. And even though your med student knows 80 or 90% of it, if you miss that 10%. And everyone's potassium means they're too low or too high or their phosphate's going somewhere and I forgot to check the RFP. I'm trying to track on all my taskers. And sometimes, like, when I order stuff, it doesn't even get done. So guess who's calling the lab, baby? Why is it this result? In oh, we never got it. Okay, um, is it sent? Hey, this is Preston with Medicine. I was wondering if you had a chance to draw the labs on that patient. Yeah, we did. We sent it to the lab. Why? Is it not there? No, it's not there! Where is my phosphate, bro? I did it. I beat medicine. Shortly after I posted my last diary, uh, my team got immediately capped and I was taking care of eight patients. It was definitely one of those get good or step off kind of moments. And I, I was just like, time to get good, I guess. Now that I'm in this learning environment and I mess up, I just do it again the next day. As a student, everything would build up to this single test, and then you would fail the test, and you just have to sit in that failure for weeks until you had the next opportunity to perform. Well, well guess what, buddy? In residency, the next opportunity is like five minutes from now. So just do it again. Oh, you, you didn't know the right indication for the heparin drip? Okay, dang, that sucks. Well, you got another heparin drip starting tomorrow, so do it then. And it feels like you're sucking the entire time, but slowly and surely you are putting out fires of your own distress and filling in gaps in your own knowledge. Within a couple of weeks, you start reflexively doing things that even 20 days ago, you wouldn't even know where to start. I was only there for a month and by the fourth week, without really thinking, I knew which diabetic medicines to continue or halt and how to like manage someone's sliding scale insulin. And that's a good feeling. You, you, feel, you feel competent seeing someone in the ED and knowing like what you can do to help them get better. And I had patients where like they would come in, they were decently sick with pneumonia or GI bleed or something. And I'd carry them through, get them discharged in four days and be like, wow, I did that for that person. It's a good feeling. But at the same time, it was a complete slog. I was getting to the hospital at 5.45 every day, and most days I was getting home 7, 7.30. The worst was, I think, 8.30 or 9. There is a unique and visceral anguish that you feel when you walk in the door and it's 8 p.m. and you know you need to be in bed in 45 minutes before you go to work again the next day. Outside of these micro successes I was having at work, I felt like the rest of my life was kind of falling apart. But that, that's hyperbolic, but I wasn't eating nearly as much as I was before. I was losing weight. I didn't, I didn't really have a time to work out. Okay, I had time to work out. I was choosing not to work out. I was choosing to get as much sleep as possible. I'm trying to use more internal locus of control language when talking about tasks that I'm unable to accomplish and reframe it as choosing not to accomplish them. Gives me a little bit more agency, I think. But seriously, it was awful. Like my apartment was a mess. Is a mess. It's still a mess. And I think the part that scared me about all of this was the anhedonia that was setting in. I would get time off and I wouldn't even feel like doing anything. I used to love playing video games and I just didn't want to do that. I like making videos. I like talking, making skits. I had no desire to do that at all either. I just kind of lay there. I just felt tired. It's kind of numb. So, um, yeah, let's, <laughs> maybe some new friends in my future. I liked medicine a lot when I rotated on as a student, and I, I still enjoyed internal medicine as a resident. I just have to acknowledge and be honest with myself about the toll it takes on me. And 
to no amount was that ever worth it. Even if I was being successful at work, I every every other aspect of my life would not be able to compensate for itself. Burnout is not classified in the DSM, but the World Health Organization recognizes it. Well, on one hand, I feel weird about pathologizing my disaffection with the system, but on the other hand, adjustment disorder can't account for everything. Basically, burnout requires three criteria to be met. The, the first is some sort of emotional exhaustion, fatigue of empathy, dissatisfaction, anything along those lines. And then that can manifest as sleeplessness and, and other things, but not fully meeting criteria for depression. Number two is increased distance from one's job. And this can come in two flavors. The first being feeling that your work isn't actually meaningful or making a difference. Or the second is more objections about what you're performing. If you're treating someone for mental illness and the best thing you could do for their suicidal prevention is, I don't know, like stable housing or like access to their medications and you're just doing your best to renew a prescription pad that will never get filled, that, that's a pretty good recipe. It's like the microwave lunchable version of burnout because it's, it's ready in just a couple minutes. Rearranging chairs in the Titanic, I mean, more unique to residents, or anyone in a subordinate position is making decisions that you disagree with and having to carry out those decisions. Maybe a surgical resident has to tell a patient that they think needs surgery that they don't because their attending doesn't want to do it. And I think this is a curse as a resident because you now know enough to have an opinion, but you're not in a position where you can make the decision, the final decision yourself. And, and to be fair, it's not your license, so you shouldn't be the one making the final decision. But you know enough that if you care, it's going to affect you. Anyways, you start to develop an indifference towards that. And the third is which would be the sign of disorder is decreased workplace efficacy. You learn to do less because you care less because you think your work is meaningless and you're frustrated. Why am I talking about this? Uh, because I'm experiencing all three. So I have an anti-burnout Preston plan. And the first thing is to um, go to the gym again. I was working out pretty aimlessly, but now I'm starting a new routine. I need to find stuff outside of work that gives me a sense of purpose because I realized I was relying too much on work to find purpose and <laughs> look where that got me. I got this burnt caramel Lululemon gym bag. I figure if I feel cool, that will increase my desire to work out. And honestly, it's working so far. I'm doing an upper lower split four days a week, which I think I can 100% do 50% of the time. Two days a week, that's all we need. That's all we need. Also, I'm taking creatine again. Number two is I'm going to um, expand my espresso setup. So right now we got the Breville Bambino and we've got a good porta filter, but I want to make this guy a bottomless porta filter here instead of these like two pokey guys in the bottom. And then we're going to expand the amount of flavors we got because all we have is caramel, French vanilla, and lavender right now. I think my end game in this kind of situation is going to be latte art because right now I'm, I'm just kind of foaming almond milk. And the almond milk lattes are good, but you know what I mean? I find it hard to think that I won't feel like there's purpose in my life if I can do latte art. I'm also doing an intake with a psychiatrist um, the third week of December because... It is very possible that I'm rationalizing all this and I'm totally depressed and I just need another opinion to weigh in on this. Despite my pride in my ability to be honest with myself, I am far too motivated to be a nonpartisan witness in my own downfall. So of course I'm just gonna say, ah, oh, it's all really fine. But we don't know that. Closing at about seven months into intern year. It is so mid. Ugh. Every day is starting to feel a little bit like Groundhog's Day. Hey, Maggie, what are you doing? Going to the leaves? My psychiatrist appointment was supposed to be last week, and he just, he canceled. I guess he got sick, and they don't have any availability for like a month and a half. What you looking at? Hmm? The irony of being a psych resident and not being able to get mental health care is, it's not lost on me, and part of me feels like I need to endure this in some way so at least i know what my patients are dealing with the other part sucks dude what the heck on my last video i was talking about how i was feeling burnt out and and i still am and i think before i was trying to be curious and say like is this d depression is this burnout like what is it how reactive am i and i think i, I kind of went from dubious about it to pr pretty sure like I would, I would need medication at this point i'm not sharing this for pity or anything else just that to show that like i'm being curious about my own situation and i'm trying to do something about it and i if anyone else is seeing this is like feeling like crap all the time 
it's, it is possible. Here are my symptoms. I sleep like crap. I fall asleep okay, but I wake up in the middle of the night around 3 or 4 a.m. and just can't fall back to sleep. I started grinding my teeth, so my bite doesn't sit well in my mouth anymore. And this is within the last like month and a half. Like I have absolutely no interest in doing anything anymore, e e whether it's at work or at home. Every single thing in my life feels like a chore. I just went snowboarding and I was very hopeful about going to the mountain. And I remember the first day I got on the slopes, it felt like nothing. And that, that was a, the hallmark moment for me because it's scary. This is something that's brought me so much joy in my entire life. And I finally have a vacation and I go out to snowboard and, and it's just, it's blank. I, I, you feel like disconnected from yourself as a human. Relative to where I was before, no energy. I have no desire to do just about anything. I'm, I'm relying a lot more on caffeine than I did before. It, and it's an attempt to self-medicate, but it's not treating the underlying cause. I don't feel like eating anything. Like I'll get home at five and the thought of cooking, Ma hey Maggie, Stay away from the trash cans, okay? Yeah, I will get home at five and I'll have no desire to eat. And I feel like I should, but honestly, it's just easier to go to bed at seven. So, so I'm running through the list. I'm like, okay. <laughs> your mind as an organ is separate from yourself. Though, though the two are quite intertwined, if an organ's dysfunctional, it's dysfunctional. I'm not like running through my list and saying, okay, like what could I benefit from? and I landed on Prozac. Prozac is mostly a, considered one of the stimulating SSRIs. It's actually because it inhibits the 5-HT2C receptor in addition to the SCRT receptor. 5-HT2C leads to increased norepinephrine and dopamine, which is probably why the stimulating effect is there. My disorder has more of a anhedonic low energy organization rather than an anxious distress organization. Side of meds, there's a lot of other things that are important to, to like address this that I'm also working on. Sleep hygiene is really important, but I can't do everything. I can't, I can't brute force it, even though I'm trying to do that. But I can get one of these 10,000 Lux lamps that they use for seasonal affective disorder. Turns out one of our landmark trials showed this was not in fear to SSRIs for seasonal depression. And also it has some evidence for depression outside of the seasonal component. There's a mountain of data of how good exercise is for both like anxiety and mood disorders. Running or cardiovascular exercise has more data than weightlifting, but weightlifting has some evidence too, as long as you're lifting hard enough. So I've been reframing looking at exercise as something therapeutic rather than as like something I have to do. I'm also trying to get in with therapy. I attempt to do CBT on myself. I'm aware of my cognitive disorders and aware of my maladaptive core beliefs, but it's hard when you're just trying to do it yourself. I feel like I'm spinning my wheels in a ditch and it'd be nice to have a, like a disinterested party or someone to bounce these ideas off of. So it's kind of my three-pronged approach. I'm trying to, to improve sleep, diet, exercise as best as I can. I think medications are definitely warranted because intern is probably only going to get worse and therapy. So this is, this is my template. I'm, I'm making a game plan. I feel like I can white knuckle it. I'm just sick of being miserable. I want to feel like a person again. I don't want to think that I need, need to wait to do that. And I feel this obligation to share it here because I'm a psychiatry resident. And I feel, I feel the need to be smart about treating myself because I'm in mental health. So I have been on antidepressants for about month and a half, month, and I gotta say, not bad. At first I was like, ah, uh, but now, what? Like, you know what I mean? I get to prescribe this stuff, are you kidding me? I feel as if I was trying to ride a bike with flat tires the entire time. And, and of course you could still get to your destination with a flat tire if you just put in enough sheer grit, but it sucks every step of the way. Whether I'm going downhill and I stop pedaling, the bike is going to grind to a halt. Or if I'm uphill and I stop pedaling, it'll immediately tip over and like doing everything was awful. Now it feels like I have air in my tires and I pedal for even a little bit. And I'm like, what is this? I can coast? I'm moving forward and I'm not just like coming and stopping because I'm not brute forcing every single task. God, I was taking vitamin D, using light therapy, working out and all that helped about this much. It did help. You know, and, there, and there's a boatload of, hey Maggie, there's so much evidence for that stuff and I pitch to my patients to work out and it is important, but meds helped so much more. And you know what else meds did? They helped me work out. They helped me eat healthy. Like it's easier to do those things when you're taking the meds to do those things. Anyways, I'm gonna spend the rest of the video showing you my houseplants because they're doing a lot better now that I'm in a good mood. Enjoy Pothos loves to sit in the kitchen right here and he gets all this light, so he's very happy. And then this guy was doing so bad, but he's coming back to life. 
my English Ivy likes to dread down here and hit. okay, play nice guys. They're, they're, I still haven't figured out how they're gonna interact with each other. And my mini Monstera just thinks he runs the place. Like, um, you don't own this office desk. I, we share this space, sir, thank you. What you doing? Mass Kane is coming back to life. He was dying there for a little while. My money tree is also improving. All this new growth coming through here. And then at the bottom, here's my philodendron. Got a ficus, a ZZ plant. I splurged on a new fiddly fig. My monstera is coming back to life. My other monstera is quite happy. I have a Peruvian monstera. I got this guy. He's a, just a regular monstera, but he has... I don't know if anyone else notices this, but I feel like I'm reaching a new tier in medicine. For example, I don't meticulously pre-round every day the way I used to. Preston in September had a freaking checklist and boxes and every single task where he had to get done, and I was like, if I miss any of these tasks, then I'm gonna die and the whole place will crumble because I can't, I can't see the big picture. Now I just feel like I have a sense of what's going on. It's like I can feel the rhythm of the hospital. I was kicking myself the other day because I didn't immediately recognize an AKI like first thing in the morning, which used to be person was on it. You know, I'm on neurology right now, so I'm doing a little bit more medicine. And I was expressing this to my senior and she said, well, you're assuming more responsibility. You're taking care of more of the big picture for all your patients and you have people under you. You're going to get to a point where you can't agonize over every detail on all of your patients. You're going to have to understand that you can trust the people below you and know that you're making the big decisions and be able to lean on them for those things. And they'll lean on you when they need to use your expertise. Obviously my expertise isn't at the top. I'm still leaning on my attending and I have top cover, which is nice to have. I was giving feedback to a med student the other day and I was telling him, hey, you, you should be thinking about these things because you'll be a sub eye in a few months and you wanna be ready to act at the level of an intern. So you can always be about a year ahead. Like me, I should be thinking about how to act like a PGY2. I should be thinking about how to act like a PGY2. Ooh. I'm reaching the part of the year where the conversation is shifting from here's how to do a good job to here's what to do when you have interns. When I have interns, I feel like I finally learned how to take care of myself. And now the new med students have matched and in a few months, I'm, I'm gonna be taking care of them. Thanks for watching the whole video. Your reward is Maggie being cootie patootie. You cootie little lady. She's such a pretty lady. Oh, yeah. Oh. Great stuff.